Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. We'll get there in just a second. The title of my message this morning, or this evening, is called No Compromise. No Compromise. The word compromise means to agree. Lower your standards to agree. Make them agreeable standards. And the gospel is clear. Paul is clear in Galatians. In fact, the entire New Testament is clear. In fact, the entire Bible is clear that the gospel does not and will not compromise. The entire gospel is clear that Jesus is not a way, but the way. The way to life and hope and peace and compassion and purpose. The Bible makes it clear that the gospel does not compromise because the gospel is the way of experiencing freedom. It can be argued or said that the Christian life is the life, not a life, but the life of freedom. But it's not freedom to do whatever we choose, but rather freedom to be who God has called us to be. We often think freedom is, I can do whatever I want. But rather, freedom, as the gospel defines it, is the freedom to be who God has called you to be. Freedom in Christ is to be transformed into the image of God that God has already called you to be. In fact, I would argue that most of us, if not all of us, know that deep down what we long for is transformation. Now, you may not verbalize it, you may not say it this way, you may not blog about it, you may not write poetry about this, but deep down in your soul, you know, you know you. You know the thoughts that go through your mind. You know the things that you've said and the things that you've done, and you long to be transformed. And so you look for it in every area of life You look to add things into your life or take things out of your life to be transformed. And this is natural because God has put this desire for transformation inside of you. Because until you become who God has called you to be, you will live perpetually restless. And you are most yourself when you are in Christ. You are most free when you are in Christ. But you cannot compromise the gospel. You cannot compromise who God has called you to be in him, free, transformed, and in his grace. You long for transformation. In fact, I would put it this way. Let's make this our anchor statement or our anchor point tonight where everything was going to come back to this. The transformation that you desire has already been delivered in the truth of Christ. In other words, everything that you long for in life to be the version of you that you really desire has already been delivered in Christ Jesus for you. And God is calling you to live inside of this identity, from this identity that he has transformed you in. And Paul is going to be relentless today in this text, compelling you and I not to compromise. If I gave you an overview real quick, so turn to Galatians 2, verse 1. We're going to go from verse 1 to verse 10. If I could give you a quick overview, I would say this is what's happening in Galatians 2, 1 through 10. Paul is going to give the people in the church of Galatia and us the assurance that his message, his gospel, has been affirmed by the leaders of the New Testament church. And he's also going to make it abundantly clear that the gospel, his gospel, or any gospel of Christ, the true gospel, the only gospel, does not compromise. You ready to get to work? Yeah. Are you guys, are you guys ready tonight? I'm, not, I'm just not feeling it. Everyone's like, yes, pastor. It's so good to be here in this evening. I slept in, snaps all around. Like, are you guys ready to go tonight? Yeah. Listen, who here knows how we preach? When I talk, you guys talk back. If you like it, what do you, what do you say if you like it? Yeah. And if you don't like it, what do you do? There's two doors that way and you can just, I'm kidding. Just email me later and I'll, and I'll avoid it. But at least you know that I read it, okay? <laughs> Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Let's go to work. Verse 1. Then after 14 years. Now what Paul is doing here. Now remember, when the Bible is written, there were no chapters or verses. The book of Galatians or the letter of Galatians was just that, a letter. Verses and chapters were added years later as reference points. 
So Paul, what he's doing here is continuing with the story that he started in chapter 1. So he says 14 years later. Now there's some argue, argument about that, what he means. 14 years from the time of his conversion or 14 years from the time he went to Jerusalem the first time. Most scholars believe that it's 14 years from the first time he went and met with Peter and some of the other leaders. I went up again to Jerusalem. So after 14 years, Paul gets to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is a very important city to the New Testament church. Jerusalem was where the Jerusalem council who led the New Testament church was. When there are important decisions to be made, it came through the council. So when Paul is saying, I went to Jerusalem, he's not just picking any city. He's picking the city from where the explosion of the Christian faith happened and where the leaders still remain. So when he says Jerusalem, he means to, pro to prove a point. What he's saying is there are leaders at Jerusalem that I went to go see. Now remember, Paul is writing this letter to the Galatian church because some false teachers have come into the church and are saying, well, Paul's gospel is not the actual gospel. Our gospel is the real gospel. So by Paul going to Jerusalem, he's saying to them, I'm going to validate to you that the people who led the New Testament church in Jerusalem have validated and affirmed the message of the gospel that I preach. So keep in mind, that is a very significant city with Barnabas. The reason Paul puts the name Barnabas in here is, one, he was with Barnabas, but Barnabas was known to the church in Galatia because Barnabas was one of the founders of that church with Paul. He, he was a companion of Paul in ministry, so Paul is mentioning, even Barnabas was with me. Now, don't miss this part, taking Titus. Now, this is very significant. We're going to see in a moment. Now, keep in mind what Paul says. Paul says, with Barnabas, but taking Titus. Keep that in mind, taking Titus with me. Verse 2. I went up because of a revelation. Now, what Paul is saying here is there's an implication happening. There seemed to be some doctrinal disagreement between what the gospel was, and Paul more than likely was invited up to Jerusalem by the council, by the leaders, to talk about this disagreement. But this is what I love about Paul. Paul is on the mission field reaching people for Jesus. And what he's saying is, I don't have time to stop and come to a meeting to discuss what we're doing. And I think Christians in our, in our day love meetings. I would die in a meeting. I hate meetings. Let's get to work. Can this be an email? Can this be a text? Can you just call me? No, we need to have a meeting about this. And then you have a meeting about the meeting and a meeting about the meeting about the meeting. And if you're American, you get, a, you get an email recap about the meeting. My, my gosh, how many meetings do we have? Meanwhile, there's work to be done. And Paul is saying, listen, I've been invited to talk to you about this dispute. You guys keep arguing. I'm going to go ahead and try to get people saved. But when Paul gets a revelation from God, he says, when God revealed to me that I should go, then Paul goes. Paul is always listening to the voice of God. Where is God leading me? Where is God taking me? And now it's significant that Paul goes to Jerusalem. So Paul goes to meet with the leaders of the Jerusalem church and set before them, this is the second part of verse two, and set before them, although privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. And you're gonna see this word Gentile throughout letters of Paul but specifically in Galatians. What Gentile simply means is anyone who was not Jewish by birth. Anyone who was not Jewish by birth is a Gentile. In order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. Now what's happening here and what's about to happen is so vitally important. And this is what I love about Paul. I think Paul is a certified genius. I think Paul must have been one of the greatest leaders the world has ever seen because what Paul is about to do next is absolutely incredible. So don't miss what's about to happen. Don't miss this part that's gonna come up in verse three and verse four. I once heard someone say that whoever tells the better story shapes the culture. That culture is shaped by the telling of stories. When I first moved to America, I thought it was really odd that grown men dressed up like Darth Vader every year. I thought it was weird that people would, would grown men and grown women would go to this comic con stuff and they would dress up as, as different Star Wars characters. Do you know why they do that? Because George Lucas tells a phenomenal story. 
And anyone who tells a phenomenal story will begin to shape the culture. Culture is shaped by very few things. Culture, you want to know what culture is shaped by? Culture is shaped by what you celebrate, what you tolerate, and the stories that you tell. Try it with your kids. If you have kids, whatever you celebrate, you will replicate. It's the culture you will. My kids will come up to me with a crappy drawing of me and them sitting by a tree. Like, oh, dad, look, I did it. It's beautiful. And of course, it's not very good. But what do you say? Like, oh, my gosh. Son, that is amazing. That's the best painting I've ever seen. You put it on the fridge. Guess what shows up on your desk the next day? Another painting of you and your sons by the tree. <laughs> whatever you celebrate, you'll, you'll replicate. And whatever you tolerate, if you tolerate something, that's the culture you'll create. Now, the one thing in my house that we don't tolerate is disrespect to their mom. I'll tolerate almost anything, but I will not tolerate my three sons being disrespectful to their mother. If they're disrespectful to their mother, they will be disrespectful to every woman they ever cross. So you will not be. That will not be tolerated in our house. And in the stories that you tell, when you tell great stories, you will shape the culture. And what Paul is about to do in this moment is tell a phenomenal story. See, Paul is not interested in winning arguments. Unlike Christians today, no offense taken, maybe you should take it, I don't know, but Paul is not in the business of winning arguments. Paul does not care about winning doctrinal arguments. Paul is trying to change the world with the message of Jesus. He is trying to change the culture of faith in the cities of God. And the way that Paul does it is by telling a powerful and incredible story. This is what Paul says. He says, he set before them the gospel. The word set before doesn't mean an oral argument. It doesn't mean a theological debate. It means to lay something down before someone for consideration. It's literally putting something in front of someone and saying, inspect it, look at it, touch it. Ask questions. See for yourself. And what does Paul set before them? Not an argument, not a theology, not his great leadership skills or his speaking ability, not the great vision that he had from God. What does Paul lay before them? He lays before them the evidence of the gospel. He lays before them a person, a person. Remember, I was with Barnabas, but I was taking Titus with me. Look at verse 3. But even Titus, but even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. What Paul is saying is because Titus was a Greek, it means he was a Gentile. But even Titus, who had been touched by the gospel, who had been, who had been transformed by the gospel, was not forced by anyone to be circumcised. Now, when the early church there was a group of people known as the Judaizers. You've heard of this before in, in our series so far in two weeks. If you get the resource guide, there's more about it in there. But the Judaizers were teachers who entered into the church and told the church that, hey, Jesus isn't enough to save you. Jesus isn't enough to keep you saved. You must adopt the Torah lifestyle, the lifestyle of faithful Old Testament Jews in every area, the dietary laws, the festival laws, the cleanliness laws, the clothing laws, and the circumcision law. Now, the circumcision was an important law for the Jews. Circumcision, first and foremost, represented that you were part of the family of God. You were in the covenant of God. It was the symbol. It was the symbol to be invited in that you represented the family of God. And secondly, it represented that you were in the covenant of God. In Genesis chapter 17, we see that God makes a covenant with a man named Abraham. And in this covenant, God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. And I will expand your people more than any other people in the world. And the sign of this covenant, the sign of this promise will be that every male has to be circumcised. Now, in the rest of Galatians, Paul will lay out some, some blatant and some strong theological arguments of what the gospel is. But in this point, in this moment, in this encounter, Paul's argument against false teachers is not a theological argument, but a story of this man, Titus. In essence, what Paul is saying is, look at this man. Look at this Greek Gentile who you and I as Jews would, would ordinarily have nothing to do with. 
We would never talk to him. We would never approach him. We would think he was less than human. And yet, the grace of God has entered into his life and transformed him to the point where he doesn't need to be circumcised because the actual thing that needed to be circumcised was his heart. And his heart has been circumcised. He now reflects the beauty of Jesus and the glory of God and the grace of God. And what Paul is saying to the Galatian church is, if circumcision was necessary, if Jesus plus the Torah was necessary, then the leaders of the Jerusalem church and the New Testament church would have made us circumcise Titus. And what Paul is saying is if Titus doesn't need to be circumcised, if they decided and we decided and God decided that no one must force this man to be circumcised, then no one else needs to be circumcised. No one else needs to follow the Torah law in order to be saved. It is by grace and grace alone that we are saved, by the blood of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, for the glory of God the Father. Do you see what Paul does? He tells a story. Look at this vile and filthy man who years ago you and I would have detested, and yet the gospel of the grace of God works for him. And if it works for him, it must work for her, and it must work for her, and it must work for him, and it must work for them. That means the gospel of the grace of God is for all people, not just for the people who look like you, not just for the people, dare I say it, who vote like you, not just for the people who lived in the same neighborhood or the same suburb or the same city. The gospel of Jesus is for all people, black people, white people, Asian people, Hispanic people, Oriental people, Latina people, Iranian people, Iraqi people, Sri Lankan people. It is for all people, and the grace of God is reflected in the story of this man, not in some powerful theological argument. What would the world look like today if we told more stories of grace instead of trying to defend God on every street corner? If we told more stories of how God is transforming you and transforming your family and freeing you from addiction and freeing you from fear and freeing you from lies, he tells a story of a man. And they accept this story. They see that grace does work, that Jesus does work. Verse 4, let's continue. Yet because of the false brothers, the word false brothers here actually means pseudo or sham Christians. It's sort of interesting. It, it kind of on the one hand confuses me, yet gives me hope that even then they were fake Christians. They were fake Christians even then. It's not just a, a fad for today. They were fake Christians. They were pseudo Christians who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. What Paul is saying is during the meeting, literally during the meeting where he's talking to the Jerusalem leaders, somehow these pseudo Christians get into the door and they begin to spy out the freedom that Paul and Barnabas and Titus have in Christ. And they try, he says, to pull them back into slavery, pull them back into the law. Demand that they do other things other than just follow Jesus. They're demanding, well, no, Jesus plus this. And Paul says they do this so that they might bring us into slavery, which would, what Paul specifically means is slavery of the law. Now, the law of God was good. God does not give any gifts or anything that is not good. God is the giver of all good things, the Bible says. So the law was good, but the law could not do what Jesus could do. The law could not perfect anyone. The law could not make you more lovable. The law could not make you more savable. The law couldn't make you a better person. In fact, all the law did, the Torah, the Old Testament, the laws of God, all they did was prove that you needed a Savior. The demand of the law was perfection. And in fact, I love when people say things like, God doesn't demand perfection. Actually, God does. If anyone ever tells you God doesn't demand perfection, that person is a liar. God does demand, demand perfection. If God is holy and blameless and righteous and nothing imperfect can enter into his presence, why would God lower the standard so imperfect people could get into his presence? No, the standard never drops. You must be perfect. Listen, you must be perfect to enter into God's presence. The law simply says you cannot be perfect. So the way that you achieve perfection is not to work for it, but to receive the perfection of Jesus. In Christ, 
You are perfect. You are holy. You are blameless. You are spotless. So the demand of the law was not met in your performance, but in the sacrifice and the obedience of Jesus on the cross. Your perfection was met in the person of Jesus. And to try to live by the law, to achieve that perfection, is nothing short of slavery. So Paul says this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to call us back into slavery. Now here's what's going on. This is an interesting sentence in in chapter 2, verse 4. It's actually a fragmented sentence that never comes to an end. It never really ends in a sentence. If I was in high school English, Miss Heckle Oliver would have put a big X through this. My favorite teacher in all of high school was Miss Heckle Oliver. I love Miss Heckle Oliver. Did I ever tell you about my story with Miss Heckle Oliver? About my journal stories? How I used to write Dave Matthews lyrics and pass them off as my own? She tried to publish it once. I told her not to, but... But there would have been a big X. Hey, 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 Paul, this is a fragmented sentence. And what this tells us about Paul is two things. Number one, Paul is highly agitated and emotional about the lies that are being told to the Galatian church. And so he's writing very quickly because he's so emotional. Ever written an email that you've been a little too emotional? Here's some good advice. Don't ever send the first email when you're emotional. Send it to yourself. Look back on it and then have your your wife look at it for you and take out a lot of stuff and then just send the, the nicest email possible. But Paul is clearly agitated. The second thing it tells us is that this was quick. It was sent very quickly. In fact, most scholars believe that this would have been a rough draft. What we have of Galatians would have been the rough draft of the letter. New Testament letters were written by a person, by Paul, but it was actually physically written by what was known as a person known as an amanuensis. They were the person who would take the draft and they would rewrite it. They would check the grammar, check the spelling, check the flow, and then they would send it, which is why Paul sometimes says, I'm writing this to you in my own handwriting. Because an amanuensis would have written it for him. It would have been his editor for him. But Paul had no time for editors. Say, I don't don't have time because the false gospel is infiltrating your life and it's calling you back into slavery. And Paul is so adamant that he wants believers to live in the freedom of God. He wastes no time to edit the letter. He wants you to know right away, hey, listen, your freedom is at stake. Your transformation is at stake. So he writes this letter and he sends it to them. And what Paul does is he makes it painfully obvious in verse 5 that he nor anyone with him nor the gospel ever compromises. He says this in verse 5. To them we did not yield into submission even for a moment. Here we have this encounter That happened before Paul and Barnabas went and and planted the church in Galatia. So this encounter happened years before they went there. And Paul says, we did not yield because if we yielded even for a moment, your freedom would have been at stake. And we would have been calling people back into slavery. And so Paul says, he's going to say this in a moment, you'll see. The reason we did not yield is because we wanted to preserve the truth of the gospel for you. So he says this in verse 5b, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Paul says if we yielded for even a moment, the true gospel, the only gospel would have been tainted and it would have brought you into slavery, not into freedom. And what does Paul say he preserved? He didn't say we preserved a lofty argument. We we preserved a really cool emotional experience for you. We preserved the way the church is supposed to historically do things. So make sure you just just bow down to your golden calves that we have always done it this way. So keep doing it this way. He's like, no, we preserved the truth of the gospel for you. And the truth of the gospel is not necessarily or not simply an ideology or a philosophy. It is a person. Just like grace is a person and peace is a person, truth is a person. In essence, what Paul is saying for you is because we did not yield for one second, we preserved Jesus for you. This is why John in the Gospel of John in John 1 says that Jesus came full of grace and truth. Jesus embodied truth. He overflowed with truth. In John 14, 6, John says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through 
me. Paul is saying, listen, I have preserved for you in Galatia. I have preserved for you in 2019 in this city, Jesus. Not the way the church has always done things, not the way that we should keep doing things, not some ideology or theory or emotional experience. I have kept Jesus intact for you, the message of Jesus, the hope of Jesus, the glory of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus. You will notice in just 10 verses, four times Paul uses the word gospel, evangelion, gospel. It it really means the good news of God. Paul is saying, I preserved for you the good news of God because what you need for your transformation, what you need in your marriage, what you need in your place of work, what you need in your dating, what you need in your money, what you need in your parenting, what you need with your dreams and your ambitions is not more churchy stuff. What you need is more of Jesus. You need the good news to enter into every circumstance of your reality. Good, bad, or ugly, you need the good news of Jesus to enter in. And what exactly is the good news? See, my whole life, I thought the good news was simply this. And you've heard the story, and I'll tell you the story for as long as I have breath in my lungs. I thought the good news of the gospel was simply be a good person. Be a good person, accept what Jesus did for you, and then that way when the rapture happens, you're not stuck with Kirk Cameron and all the other crazy people on earth. (laughs) Jesus will take you with him. And I really thought the good news was just do whatever you want. Do whatever you want because your ticket has been stamped. You got your golden ticket to heaven. And the way that I came to know Jesus, my Jesus take the wheel moment was writing a paper for my New Testament class. Writing a paper for Professor Gunlock in my New Testament class. And I'm writing a paper on Ephesians. And I get to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 and Paul puts it this way. He says that we are transgressors before God, that we are sinners before a holy and righteous God. In fact, what Paul says is that you are dead before God, even when we were dead in our trespasses. God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved through faith. And I realized it wasn't my performance or it wasn't my grades or it wasn't the fact that I went to church 17 times a day. The reason that I got pulled into the gospel was because the gospel got poured into me. And the grace of God entered into me. And Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. He continues this and he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. What Paul is saying is the good news of the gospel is that you cannot earn anything from God. You cannot strive from God. You cannot do the law well enough for God to love you. You are saved by grace and by grace alone. And that grace is displayed on the cross of Jesus. Jesus goes to the cross and he exchanges all of your sin for all of his righteousness, all of your guilt for all of his grace. And he pours inside of you the very spirit of God. The spirit of God, the Bible says, dwells inside of you, a believer of him. You are saved by no effort of your own, by no decision anyone can make for you. Your parents can't make this for you. Your children can't make this for you. Your pastor can't make it for you. Your nation can't make it for you. No one can make the decision. Only you can decide what you will do when you encounter the grace of God. Will you keep attempting to do it your own way or will you receive the grace of God to transform you from the inside out and present you before God holy and blameless? This is the good news of the gospel, that you would live in the sufficiency of God for all things. So Paul continues in verse 6, And from those who seem to be influential, what they are makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. I just love that Paul puts that in there. I met with some influential people. I don't really care who they were, but I mean, if you want to know, they were important. But I don't really care that they were important. I just love that Paul puts that in there. Like, he honestly just doesn't care about anyone's fame. And like, your Instagram followers would not impress Paul at all. I got 100,000. I got 10,000 I can swipe up. Dude, I just don't care. I, I mean, Paul is still probably still rocking Zanga if he was alive, alive today. He's, he has a Tumblr account. He doesn't care about any of this stuff. I don't care who is in the room. Those, I say, who seemed influential, he adds this added nothing. I was in a room 
with a bunch of important people who I honestly don't care about, their important status. God shows no partiality, and by the way, they added nothing to me. Wouldn't you just love to have that kind of faith? You could walk in a room and not care what anyone thinks. No one adds anything to you. You don't find any validation from them. You don't have to prove anything to them. Like, man, you add nothing to my life. What Paul is saying is, is very quickly four things in verse 6. First, he's saying that God looks at humanity different than we look at God, different we, than we look at people. We look at people based on importance, how much money they make, how popular they are, how much power they have, how famous they might be. And he's saying God doesn't look at any of that. God looks at the heart. God does not look at exterior circumstances. God does not look at exterior appearances. We see this throughout the Bible. God repeatedly chooses people that nobody would choose. So if you feel like a nobody, you are in good company. God loves to use people who think they are nobodies. Secondly, Paul is saying that the leaders have affirmed and validated my message and my ministry. Thirdly, Paul is saying that even though they affirmed it and acknowledged it and validated it, they have no authority over my message or my mission. And fourthly, Paul, when he says added nothing, is reminding them my gospel, the gospel of grace that I received, came from no human mouth. I received it from Jesus and Jesus alone. They added nothing to my understanding of the gospel. They added nothing to my message of the gospel. Verse 7. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, now uncircumcised very quickly just simply means those outside of the covenant of God. You'll see this in the Old Testament a lot. They'll, they'll go to war and they'll say, let's go fight against those uncircumcised fellows. They're not making fun of them. They're not teasing them. They're just saying those guys are outside of the promise. We are in the promise of God, and they are outside of the promise of God. Just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. Now that means those who were Jewish by birth. He's saying, I was entrusted to those who are not Jewish by birth, Gentiles, while Peter was entrusted to take the gospel to those who are Jewish by birth. Verse 8, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through mine for the Gentiles. Verse 9, and when James, this would be the brother of Jesus, and Cephas, who would be Peter, who walked with Jesus, and John, another disciple of Jesus, who walked with Jesus, who seemed to be pillars. What Paul means by that word pillars is they were clearly important leaders in the New Testament church. Perceive the grace that was given me. They gave the right hand of fellowship, which means they gave, it was a gesture of approval and acceptance. We approve and we accept this message from God that you have. To Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So if we want to summarize all of this encounter so far, what we'll see is Paul is simply saying this. Because there are false leaders and false teachers in the church, I took the message of the gospel. I shared what God was doing amongst the Gentiles. I showed them how grace is transforming people into the image of God. And the leaders of the New Testament church validate and they agree that this is, in fact, the gospel. Secondly, they believe and I believe and we believe that the unity of the church is important. So we can't have these two separate uh, doctrines floating around. We believe in one God and one gospel and one mission. And Paul, you go to the Gentiles and you reach the Gentiles with the good news of Jesus. And Peter and the other leaders, they would go to the Jewish people and they would lead them to know Jesus. So they were saying, hey, each of us has our own role in the mission. Now, it wasn't competition at all, because we see that Paul led Jewish people to Jesus, and Peter led Gentiles to Jesus. There was no competition, but there were some specific roles. You take this role, and I'll take this role. Ultimately, what is important is that we are one church unified with one God and one gospel. Take the message out to the world, and they bless Paul to go out. They saw that he was entrusted with the gospel, and they say this in verse 10 to sort of wrap up. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Specifically in verse 10, what's happening here is when Paul had visited the church in Jerusalem in this encounter, the church was such a large size. It was a massive church. The church of Jerusalem was a very big church. They were also poor because of the famine. And so Paul had brought them resources and food, especially to the poor. So Peter is reminding them, hey, as you go out, continue to think about and care for the poor. Listen, the poor is in the heart of God. 
God cares for the poor. We should care for the poor, especially those in our own body. And so Paul says, absolutely, I love the poor because God loves the poor, and I will continue to raise up resources for other churches where there are poor people who need basic things like food and water. It's an incredible encounter that we see that Paul has with the leaders of Jerusalem. And then he's warning the church in Galatia, don't compromise. Don't compromise your transformation. Don't compromise grace. Don't compromise the gospel. And I told you that the title of this message was No Compromise, because I believe that we're living in a time and a generation where we are prone to compromise. We compromise what we believe. We compromise what we say. We compromise who we listen to. We compromise what we do with our bodies. We compromise what we do with our relationships. We compromise virtually everything. If we're honest, and I'm not not assuming that we are, but if we're honest, we compromise and we lower the standard to agree with the world around us. And Paul is adamant, do not compromise the gospel. Do not compromise the transformation that God is working and doing in your life. Do not settle for a faith that will lead you into slavery rather than a faith that will take you into freedom. Don't make a bad deal. And I think many of us, if we're not honest, if we're not careful, are making bad deals. We don't even know it. A friend of mine, he's, he's my age, but he's a brilliant, brilliant business guy, very successful. And his son, I went over to their house one day, and his son is sitting there, and he's selling candy. And if you know me, I love candy. I will take candy from anyone. Candy is my kryptonite. I will take it from your child. I love candy. Here, I repent every day, and I go right back to bed. I love candy. And so I walk in, and he just, he's like a crack dealer. He just knows that, like, I'm just going to dominate this block, and the roof's going to come over, and I'm going to get some sales tonight. So he's selling candy, and he goes, one piece for a dollar. Man, that's kind of expensive. So I go, man, what about three pieces for two dollars? And he goes, hmm. What about five pieces for a dollar? Deal! <laughs> you just made a bad deal, kid. I mean, I think the business DNA from his dad didn't quite get took all this candy. (laughs) And some of us are doing that with our faith. How about freedom and transformation and grace and holiness? Nah, I choose fear. I choose addiction. I choose hopelessness. I choose bad friends. I choose to compromise on my body. I choose to spend my money on myself. I choose the gospel of self-autonomy because the Lord knows it brings the real freedom that I long for. And Paul is saying, you're making a bad deal. Don't compromise. Because here's what happens when you compromise, or when we refuse to compromise, rather. When we refuse to compromise, we experience the power to actually resist. We experience the power to resist. You have to ask, how did these guys, how did these Judaizers get into this meeting? If they had the kind of faith where they were blatantly, they were blatantly lying, blatantly saying things that were not true to the gospel, they wouldn't have been invited to the meeting. But see, the most dangerous kind of lie is the one that's so close to the truth. The most dangerous lie in your life is the one that is so close to the truth. And you know what? Our podcasts are full of them. We listen to preachers who are so close to the truth, but just far enough away to be dangerous. We listen to politicians. We listen, we have authors of books that we read. And Paul is adamant. That's how they got in. Because they lied and they lie and their lies are subtle. They're not blatant out of nowhere like, whoa, man, that's just a crazy blatant lie. They are subtle. I love the words of of this Johnny Swim song. I think it's called Diamonds. And in one of the verses, she says, Don't you hear, don't you think I hear the whispers, those subtle lies, those angry pleas? They are demons, demons, wishing they were free like me. These subtle lies are pulling you back into slavery. And Paul cares. Paul cares when the people of God are being lied to because Paul started this church. Have you ever invested your life into someone 
over and over and over again. And when they're lied to, don't, don't you get emotional about it? I, I went to lunch the other day with my son, and he said, Dad, Gabe told me that LeBron is better than Michael Jordan. Well, Gabe is a heretic. <laughs> I forbid you to hang out with Gabe. So I went to lunch, and I saw Gabe. He's like, hey, Jai's dad. <laughs> what? What's wrong? Oh, you, oh, you, you, you know Gabe. Jai, you are forbidden to hang out with this heretic. Because I care. I'm trying to decide what my son to know the truth. To know the truth of who Michael Jordan is. Paul cares that you are being lied to. These Judaizers are coming in. And listen, if you're not careful, there's people entering into your life. There's people entering into your world by technology, by relationships. And they are subtly lying to you and drawing you back into a life of slavery. And Paul says, if you stand firm in the gospel, you actually resist you will, ye you will not yield for one moment. So we do not yield for one moment. Because people are trying to rob you of God's truth. People are trying to rob you of God's power. People are trying to rob you of God's purpose. And Paul says, not for one moment should you yield. You stand firm in the gospel of God. Do not move. Stand firm in the hope. Of God. I love the way Eugene Peterson says this. He says, There are people who do not want us to be free. They don't want us to be free before God, accepted just as we are by His grace. They infiltrate communities of faith to spy out the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and not infrequently find ways to control, restrict, and reduce the lives of free Christians. And Paul says, In Christ, you have the power to resist. The power to resist the false gospel of self-autonomy, the false gospel of self-sufficiency, the false gospel of so, the social gospel, the political gospel, the rights gospel, the legalism gospel, the lawlessness gospel, in Christ. In Christ is the only way to stand firm against false gospels. And here's the second thing, and we'll end with this. What we see from this text together is when we stand firm in the gospel, we express the power of grace. In other words, grace is seen in us. <clears throat> you have to ask the question, why did they validate Paul's message? Was it because they saw his incredible leadership skills? Would they saw like, man, if Paul leads this thing, it's just going to grow and explode. And I mean, who cares what the message is as long as we got numbers? As long as we are the religion that is dominating right now, I mean, who cares? We're going to be on the cover of every magazine. Because we got numbers. Is that what they care about? Is, is it because, wow, his argument was so, was so incredibly articulate. Why did they receive Paul's message? I'm convinced it's because they saw the grace that was evident in the life of Paul and Barnabas and Titus. Remember, Peter, James, and John walked with Jesus. If anyone knew grace, if anyone knew what grace does in the lives of people, it would be these three men who walked with Jesus, and they saw the evidence in Peter's life, in, in Paul's life, and in Barnabas' life, and especially Titus' life, that grace had touched them. It says in verse 9, perceived the grace. In fact, the, the exact Greek word means to know, especially through personal experience. They experienced the grace of God as they were with this person. Let me ask you a very tough question. Do people experience the grace of God when they sit with you? Do people experience the grace of God when they work with you? Do people experience the grace of God when they talk with you? Do people experience the grace of God when they serve with you? Do your kids experience the grace of God in your life? Does your spouse experience the grace of God in your life? Listen, you can know all the right words, you can memorize grace, you can teach grace, but you may not actually have ever encountered grace. Because grace, by nature, is transformative. The gospel, by nature, when experienced, is expressed. Let me say that again. Grace experienced is grace expressed. You cannot help but express grace once you have actually experienced it. And this is why I so believe in the power of telling stories. 
when other people ask about our church and how's the church going, how's life going, how are things going there, I don't, I don't talk about numbers. I don't talk about, oh, we had this many, this service, and we're doing this and this and this, where I tell the stories. And the stories I love honestly telling are the stories of restoration, the stories of reconciliation, the stories of healing, and I love telling stories of baptism. I love it. And I, and I have on my phone tons of pictures of people in our church who've been baptized. It's like, oh man, look at this. Let me tell you about Brett. Let me tell you about Nathaniel. Let me tell you about Jeffrey. Let me tell you about Mo. Let me tell you about, let me tell you about what God has done in their life. And let me, let me show you what grace looks like. I tell stories. Because stories transform the world. They shape the culture we want. I want people, when they meet someone from this church, they don't say, wow, their intellectual prowess is like none other. Wow, they can really, really sing. Although I would love for us to really, really sing. Oh, wow. They, they, they know all the right answers. Well, that would be great too, but I want them to say, man, those are people touched by grace. Those are people who walk with grace. Those are people who grace is pouring out over them. Man, they speak it and they sing it and they love it and they share it and they evidence it. I mean, grace is just pouring out of them. I mean, they are people of forgiveness. They are people who reconcile. They are people who restore. They are people who seek and confess when they have done wrong. I mean, they, they are people of humility because grace is working in them. And they saw the grace in Paul's life. And I wonder in your life and my life, would people say they have been touched with the gospel because grace has touched them? And I can feel it. I can feel when I'm in their presence, the grace of God. So let me ask you just a few questions as we wrap up. Where in your life are you compromising? Where in your life are you yielding to lies and yielding to the fear and yielding to the false gospel? Even one area, what is one area of your life where you are yielding and compromising? And maybe you're like, I don't have, I don't have any. Well, here's the litmus test. Where in your life are you experiencing no joy, no peace, no hope, no assurance, and no transformation. Because your transformation is at stake. God wants to transform you from the inside out. Every single part of you. And this is what the gospel does. This is what the grace does. I wrote this down. Let me read it for us as we finish. You can know about the gospel. You can memorize it, you can teach it, and you can share it without ever being touched by it. Because when you are touched by the gospel, the radical message of salvation by grace through faith, you are changed. You don't have to submit to anyone's expectations and demands. You are invited to live in the endless sufficiency of Christ. You are invited to live in the power of the gospel, to express the power of his grace, and to experience the power to resist those who push against you your freedom. You are transformed from the inside out. It does not come from burden, from striving or inheriting or compromising. It comes by the grace of Jesus and his grace 